okay, here I am walking to school with my two boys, uh, Sam and Jackson, they're 8 and 10. Actually, um, when you've got a 10 year old, you don't know this, you don't walk with them, you walk back at them, way back. Actually, way, way back. Who would have known that, frankly, when you turn 4 turns 10, your dad turns uncool. <laughs> but we're halfway there, and a four wheel drive leaps up onto the curb in front of the boys. I stroll up, window comes down, and Zoom voice comes out. You guys alright? What's wrong? You need a lift. Is your car broken down? <laughs> like, what the hell? Uh, no, no, we're walking. <laughs> and I, I, I kept going. And it struck, like, I've been involved in deviant behaviour in my time, folks. <laughs> but walking isn't, I, I know what it is, but this walking is not deviant. And it struck me as I continued on that for our children there's this new normal. A new normal. It involves sitting at home in front of the TV, the computer, the video games. In cars, to school, from school, to all manner of after school activities. We've now put motion sensors in my research group on several thousand New Zealand children, and one thing is striking that children are 30% less active on weekends. And as an adult, you as adults, I wonder if you're struck by that. I think we all are, aren't we? We're ex-children, and as ex-children, <laughs> we reflect on a childhood that was a free-range childhood. Do you know what I mean? You do, don't you? You're out in the morning in the neighbourhood. The neighbourhood is the safety net. You might come home at lunch, you might not. And you come home when it's dark or you get 200, whichever comes first. <laughs> Sitting's in, or what's out is risk. And it's this notion that when you protect our kids, a bubble wrap generation, and I believe it's our parents, us, and we're driving them literally towards this. And you'll see these sorts of parents at any school, uh, before school, after school, and some even hang around during school. I mean, what the hell is what's that about? <laughs> um, and we've called them helicopter parents. They hover. You can see them hovering around. And, and when you get to high school, they, they stop, they touch down and they become lawnmower parents. And they mow down anything in their children's path. This new normal at my children's school, and, and this is, these are all true, there's now a staggered finishing time to cope with the sheer volume of traffic coming through the purpose-built road at that school. Because hardly any kids walk or cycle because you're not allowed to without an adult supervising you. Bull rushes out, has been for decades, tree climbing's gone, there's a beautiful bush area at the back of the school, you're not allowed in it anymore. What a shame, but the, the good thing about that is this urban myth that my eight year old told me about the other day, Dad, in that bush, is a dead dog, <laughs> and a dead man. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm pretty sure there's not, but you know, what would, wouldn't it be fun finding out? <laughs> the school board last week is investigating setting up a large fence around the school to keep predators out. Honestly, the emperor's got no clothes. The, the, the school has had no predators in it ever. <laughs> I'm the only person with my kids who uses that to test your exit, so perhaps it's me the undesirable. <laughs> but, and, and last weekend in this new normal, we, we drove 60 kilometres to a 40 minute 10 year old rugby game each way, a new normal. The reality is, that, and our research shows this, as do dozens of other people around the world, that humans are designed to operate best in an unstable outdoor environment in more or less constant motion. Let's just go through that again. Unstable, outdoors, constant motion. When you confine humans, confine, that's what we're doing, is they suffer badly on almost every health and psychological parameter we can measure. Not the least being this wave of chronic disease that's sweeping humanity. These are, let's just get this straight, people will die of apathy after a life of affluence. Apathy, affluence. Go figure. And our kids might be the first generation where we, they have a shorter life expectancy than us. The first in human history. 
As a father, I find that unacceptable. Do you? The great paradox of this risk aversion is that in avoiding risk for our children, in the long run, they are less able to handle risk. The part of your brain that manages risk and controls your emotion develops through childhood. It's the prefrontal cortex. You can almost touch it right behind your forehead here. And it develops through childhood when your brain is exposed to actual risk. When do you think is the best time to learn about risk? When you're six, up a tree? Or 16, behind the wheel of a Subaru Legacy with the police chasing you? <laughs> when do you think is the appropriate time to get into the fight? When you're five with your next door neighbour and you learn that getting punched hurts and if you punch them, they're not your mate anymore? Or is it when you're 25 in a bar? When do you think is the right time to learn about social exclusion and working with others as humans need to do? When you're seven or when you're 27? Mum can't help you either way. <laughs> so so, so I'm, I'm, thinking about, I'm thinking about a risk analysis that goes like this. If there's this much risk and this much benefit, let's forget that, we're not stupid. When there's this much risk and this much benefit, it's a no-brainer. Perhaps we could rethink successful parenting as not being the number of activities we've taken our children to, but the number of band-aids we used that week. <laughs> I'm not... Actually, the kids are keen for this. The kids are keen. And our research shows that time and time again. The kids are up for it. And frankly, you would think the parents would be too. This is all you have to do. You hang your car keys up, you open the back door, kick their asses out, <laughs> and you open a bottle of Chardonnay. <laughs> Now, I don't mean to say that idle parenting is good parenting, but what I do know is this, that risk and adventure on their own terms for a free-range childhood is not just a good to have for children's health, it's essential for their health and development. It's essential. Now, how did we get here? Well, we wallowed for decades in cheap, unsustainable fuel. We suburbanised. We lost our local destinations, we became car dependent, and then we built cities for cars, not for people. Where was that going? Nowhere. So we've got a chance here to reimagine Christchurch, rethink a city where local living is normal. A city for people, not for cars. For people, for children, where they have both a place and our permission to range around the neighbourhoods again. We've seen this though, haven't we? Do you remember? It was just after the earthquake. There was no power. The TVs didn't work. There was nothing to go to. Roads couldn't drive on. The children came out and we saw Christchurch as it could be. A city reconnected socially. Neighbourhoods. Social reconnection. Our kids can do that. We can do it again. Let's reimagine Christchurch as a city that has not just physical change, but the social change we need to accompany that. And that social change can help bring back these free-range kids from the brink of extinction. We can lead New Zealand and then the world into this change where free-range kids once again run the planet. The reality is, and I've heard this in this conference, we're not building this city just for us. We're building it for our children and their children and their children again. And they need local living so they can have our childhood. Thank you.